Hi, everybody. Wave if you can hear us. Yeah, Hi, everyone. Do you want to start with the meditation? Yeah, so I think what we're going to do, just to get us started out on the right note, um, I'm going to lead us uh, with the help of the beans of light on a little uh, meditation. So get comfortable. Um, if it's safe to do so, you can gently close your eyes. Begin bringing awareness into the body and begin bringing awareness to the flow of the breath. that beautiful inflow, always followed by the outflow. Just breathing in peace, connection, and letting go of all commotion, all tension, Breathing in this present moment right now. And breathing out and letting go of past and future. Allowing yourself the sacred gift of being right here, right now. And bringing some awareness to the soles of your feet and connecting to and inviting in Mother Earth allowing her beautiful energy to flow into you through the soles of your feet, nourishing and resourcing you. Allowing that energy to move fully into you all the way up the legs, into the torso, all the way up the spine, and down the arms, all the way into the head. And there at the very top of the head, connecting to and opening up the crown chakra, allowing in a beautiful divine column of white light source essence, beingness, allowing this energy to move into you and into your awareness, filling you and resourcing you, reminding you of your true nature and the true nature of all. Allowing this energy to fully move into you, all the way into the body. This formless essence. This love and light that is the very fabric of the universe. Allowing this to come back into your conscious awareness as the truth of who you are. Allowing that energy all the way into the body, all the way down to the tips of the toes, 
and soles of the feet, meeting again with Mother Earth's energy. Now bringing awareness to the heart area. Just resting in that beautiful mixture of love energy of Mother Earth, of Source, of you, all aspects of the one love light. Just feeling these energies as they swirl in your heart space. Reminding you what is truly important and what is truly real in this world, which is love. Gently beginning to bring your awareness back fully into the room. Gently beginning to open your eyes, bringing awareness back to the screen. I'm ready to share in this, this gift of time we have together. Okay. Thank you, Lisa. And thank you, Beings of Light, for guiding that meditation. Uh, we do these free evenings once every couple of months or so. And I know some of you, I recognize your names and your faces, and you've been with us for a while, you've done workshops, you've come to other free evenings. Uh, but many of you I know are new to our work, and this is the first event you've come to. So for the benefit of those of you who are new to our work, uh, I want to start by giving you the basics in regard to pre-birth planning and the reasons why we plan big challenges before we're born. Now, those of you who have heard this before, either think of it as a good review, or it's summertime, at least in the Northern Hemisphere, take an ice cream break, go get some ice cream for a few minutes. Ice cream is an excellent use of an earthly incarnation. And you can quote me on that if you want to. Uh, I'm I sorry for those of you who are, are lactose intolerant though. <laughs> They make lactose-free ice cream. That's true. Uh, I want to go over the five big reasons why we plan challenges for ourselves before we're born. Uh, and this is what I found in the research for the books, and it's been further confirmed uh, in my work as a hypnotist doing between lives soul regressions. So the first reason is balancing and releasing karma. It's important for you to understand balancing karma and releasing karma are not the same thing. Balancing karma means you plan to have a new experience in an upcoming lifetime that energetically offsets a previous experience. Releasing karma means you heal the underlying tendency that created the karma in the first place. In other words, if all you do is balance karma without also releasing it, you'll just end up recreating the same karma over and over again. The example I like to use for balancing karma uh, if two people had a past life together in which one was ill and the other was the caregiver, when those two people transition back into spirit at the end of that lifetime and have their life review, as we always do, they'll see the caregiving relationship portrayed in the life review. And when they see that, they may or may not have a feeling of completion in regard to that relationship. If they feel complete with it, then as I understand it, there is no karma and they'll go on to plan something completely new. But if they feel incomplete for any reason with the caregiving relationship, the feeling of incompletion is the karma. So let's say they feel that way, how can they balance the karma? Well, the easiest thing to do is just to trade places. So now the one who was ill plans to be a caregiver, the one who was the caregiver plans the life challenge of physical illness. That's the first main reason for planning big challenges before birth, 
balancing and releasing karma. The second main reason is healing. And there's a great story that illustrates this in my first book, Your Soul's Plan. There's a chapter in that book about the pre-birth planning of deafness and blindness. The deafness story is about a young woman. Uh, her name is Penelope. She was 24 at the time I spoke with her for the book. Penelope was born completely deaf in both ears. Uh, in working with one of the mediums on the team, I had the extraordinary opportunity to go into Penelope's pre-birth planning session and actually hear the conversation that had taken place when she planned the deafness. And what comes out of that conversation? Uh, we learned that in the lifetime immediately previous to this one, she had the same mother she has in this lifetime. And in that past life, when she was a little girl, she heard her mother shot to death by the mother's boyfriend. Now she didn't actually see the murder, but she heard the gunshots that led to her mother's death. As you can imagine, she was traumatized by that, so much so that it led to suicide later in that incarnation. So she returned to spirit from that lifetime with what we could call an energy of unhealed trauma, which now needs to be healed. In the pre-birth planning session, her spirit guide says to her, my dear, would you prefer to be born deaf so that no similar trauma will happen to you again and so that you can complete your healing from the last lifetime? And Penelope responds, yes, that is what I want and what I wish to do. And then what ensues is a fascinating dialogue between her and her spirit guide in which they work out the details, the deafness. That's reason number two, healing. Third reason for planning big challenges before we're born is service to others. Every single one of you has service to others as some component of your pre-birth plan. It's in literally every single pre-birth plan I've ever looked at. It's always there in one form or another. The way I understand the orientation to service, it's a natural expression of oneness consciousness, which is our natural state of consciousness when we're back home on the other side. In other words, let's say that you and I are back on the other side and we're planning an incarnation together. And you experience, you perceive that I am literally you. It's not just a concept the way it is here. You actually experience that I am you. Well, of course, then you will want to be of service to me. And conversely, if I experience that you are literally me, then of course, I will want to be of service to you. So this orientation towards service, which again is in everybody's pre-birth plan as far as I know, I think it's just a natural expression of oneness consciousness, which is our natural state when we're home on the other side. That's the third main reason for planning big challenges before we're born, service to others. The fourth reason, and I think this is probably the big one out of the five, is a desire to experience contrast. And let me explain what I mean by this. The non-physical realm we come from, as I understand it, is a realm of complete unconditional love. It's also my understanding that we as souls are made literally from the energy of unconditional love. So if we are made from unconditional love and we're in a realm of only unconditional love, that means that we experience no contrast to ourselves, which in turn means we don't fully understand or appreciate who or what we are. We don't know what it means to be a being made from the energy of unconditional love. So I think what we as souls are doing here on the physical plane is that we have come for the contrast, the not love, you could say, which we would all agree there's a lot of, because through the experience of the not love, by the time you go home at the end of an incarnation, you understand much more deeply what unconditional love really and truly is, which is another way of saying you now have a much more profound self-knowing. You understand now what it means to be a soul made from the energy of unconditional love. Now, I understand this is a somewhat arcane concept. So to make it more accessible, I like to borrow an analogy from a book other than one of my own. You've probably heard of the Conversation with God books by the American author, Neil Donald Walsh. In one of those books, in one of his discussions with God, 
this subject of contrast comes up. And God asked Neil to explain it using the analogy of the white room, which goes like this. Imagine that you are a white being in a white room. So you are white. The ceiling is white. The floor is white. All the walls around you are white. Everything in this room is white, including you. Now, if you are such a being in such a room, how do you know that you're white? The answer is you don't. And in fact, you can't until you experience something that is other than white. Then once you've had that experience, then you understand what it means to be a white being in a white room. This I think is why we are here on the physical plane. We are love. We are in this realm of only love. We experience no contrast to ourselves. We therefore don't understand fully who or what we are. And so we come from the contrast, the experience of the not love, because through that experience, by the time you go home, you have a much more profound self-knowing. That's reason number four, contrast. And the fifth and final reason, strictly speaking, is a subset of number two, healing, but it's so common and so important, I like to break it out as a separate item of its own. And that is healing or correcting false beliefs or false feelings about oneself. And let me explain how this works. Almost everybody has had at least one past life, and usually many, in which certain things happened that caused you to pick up a false feeling or false belief about yourself. When I say false, I mean from the perspective of your soul. Two of the most common false beliefs or feelings about self are one, that one is powerless, and two, that one is unworthy or perhaps even worthless. If you feel or believe yourself to be powerless, unworthy, or worthless, to your soul that feels discordant. In other words, your soul knows that these beliefs or feelings are not true. And because they're not true, because they feel discordant, your soul wants you, the incarnate personality, to clear or release the false feeling or false belief. So how do you do that? Well, here in what was third density, it's actually now fourth density, but here in the physical realm, what will happen is you will draw or magnetize to yourself experiences that seem on the surface to confirm the false belief or the false feeling. This is actually a fundamental function of life in the third dimension. The world mirrors you back to you so that you can find out what lies within your consciousness, even if it's at the subconscious level, and then bring it to the light of conscious awareness where you can then set about healing it. So if you feel or believe yourself to be powerless, unworthy, or worthless, you'll draw to yourself experiences that seem to confirm that belief or feeling to you. Now, I realize what I have just described might sound harsh and perhaps even punitive, but I can assure you it is not the universe's intention to be either harsh or punitive. The universe is loving. And what it's trying to do in its infinite love for you is mirror you back to you so that you can find out what lies within your consciousness, even if it's subconscious, bring it to the light of conscious awareness, and then you can set about healing it. That's reason number five, healing or correcting false beliefs or false feelings about oneself. So there you have pre-birth planning 101 in a nutshell. Those are the basics. Should we uh, go into this? Sure. Um, do you want to also share um, your story about what you found is the basis of? Oh, well, which story are you thinking? The one in Chicago. You... Yeah, uh, so what Liesl is talking about, well, let me back up for a moment. So if we go back to those five main reasons, uh, if, if they all have a common denominator, if you distill them down, the common denominator is that we are here learning lessons in how to give and receive love more fully and freely. That is the bottom line reason why just about every single person is on the planet. So a number of you submitted questions along the lines of what is my life plan or what is my life purpose? There's the you know, 10,000 foot view of the answer. 
your life plan or your life purpose is to learn to give and receive love more freely and fully. And I want to emphasize from your soul's perspective, the receiving is just as important as the giving. People on a spiritual path sometimes make the mistake of over-focusing on giving, in particular giving love. Your soul would like you to receive love just as much as you give it. The flow of love in the world is circular in nature. Half the circle is giving love, half the circle is receiving love. If you don't allow others to give love to you, you're blocking half of that circle. In other words, you're blocking the entire flow of love in the world. The story that Liesel is referring to uh, gave me uh, experiential confirmation of what I just told you. This was back in uh, 2003. I was living in Evanston, Illinois at the time and uh, was in the corporate world at that point in my life. Uh, was self-employed as a marketing and communications consultant, which I did not enjoy at all. And one day uh, in the middle of a weekday afternoon, I decided to take a break from this work and just go for a walk. So I was doing nothing more than walking down the sidewalk in the middle of the afternoon and all of a sudden I had this experience in which every time I looked at another person, this feeling of pure, overwhelming, unconditional love for that person flowed over me. Now I had never heard of anything like this or read about anything like this, but I understood intuitively what was happening, which was my soul was saying to me, this love is who you really are. This is your true nature. I was caused to know that that was the message. And I got that message loud and clear. Now, what I didn't know at the time was why that was happening. That became clear a couple of years later. By that time, I had looked at a lot of people's pre-birth plans for my first book. And what I found without exception in every case, the pre-birth plan was always based on complete unconditional love for every person involved. This was true even when great challenges were being planned. And it was true even when quote unquote negative roles were being scripted for other people. It was always based on complete unconditional love for every person involved. And then I realized, aha, that experience walking down the sidewalk a couple of years ago, that was gifted to me so that when I found this result in my research, I would be absolutely certain that what I was finding was truth. And this is why I can sit before you tonight and say to you with complete confidence and complete certainty that I believe that we as souls are made literally from the energy of unconditional love. Because that was my experience walking down the street that day. Yeah. And, you know, another thing that it, it makes me, that story and also um, what you share about con um, contrast being one of the main reasons that we incarnate it makes me think of what the beings of light uh, often share, which is that this love that you are, this, this love essence of unconditional love that is actually who you are, is unchangeable. Is You can stretch it and contort it and you can pile all kinds of things on top of it. That's the things we pile on top of it are who we mistake ourselves to be, but that that fundamental nature, it's like the infinite stretchability of love. You could stretch it and twist it and contort it, and that's all the contrast, but you cannot break it. You cannot change its fundamental nature. And you so you cannot change your fundamental nature, which is the essence of love and light. The only thing that you can do is not accurately perceive it. And so that's what so many of us are doing in the world is we're not accurately perceiving that we are love and light. And we're not accurately perceiving that everybody else in the world is love and light. And actually we are all this one field or fabric and we're all interconnected. It's one conscious awareness that emanates love and light 
that is having all these different points of experience in the form of me, in the form of you. Um, and we just, we just perceive all of the, instead, we perceive all these things that we have piled on top of them, on top of that, that are changeable, you know, like personality traits, you know, what, what my identification with, with a body, with a physical, uh, with how you look, you know, all of those sorts of things, those, those can change, but the fundamental beingness that you and all others are that is interwoven into as the fabric of the universe that is eternal and infinite. So people on a spiritual path often ask, how should I live my life? The way I like to answer that question is whenever you have to make any decision, no matter how big or how small, ask yourself the following question. What would love with a capital L do now? Whatever the answer to that question is, do that. If you do that, when you have your life review, you will be thrilled with the way you lived your life. Okay. So um, would you want to share a little bit about what this is from? Yeah. So uh, we thought next, where at least and I are working on a, a book, uh, which will probably be out sometime in the fall, I would think late fall. It's a collection of her channelings of the beings of light. And each channeling is followed by a commentary written by me. We'll probably call those Rob's reflections or something equally clever. So we picked one of those uh, for you tonight. And Lisa is going to read the channel part and then I will read what I wrote about the channeling. Yeah, so something new we're trying. Uh, the title of this channeling is A Communication of Profound Love from the Bees. We come to you now from a part of us that is the loving intelligence that oversees the bees of your world. Some call this loving intelligence the deva of bees. We so dearly hope that you humans find your way to your own version of hive mindedness to the realization of your connectedness and interdependence with all. Your expansion into the fullness of this awareness is imperative for all of us who have our home on earth with you. We have surrendered and entrusted our fate at the physical level to you. Please hold it gently and lovingly. You are indeed a unique species because of your ability to think in complex ways, you also face a unique challenge for the mental structures that develop in you can often block your awareness of your natural connection to all. You forget the true intelligence that is within you and mistakenly believe that the intelligence of the mind is the truth. You have been chosen to make a great leap in evolution you who are reading this now are those who will show the way, those who are beginning to allow this true intelligence of the universe to fully arise within. This true intelligence can then flow into the mind and generate thoughts and ideas that are in harmony with the well being of all on the planet. When, as a species, the majority of humans are in a state of allowing this transformation within themselves, there will be the dawn of a new age of love and harmonious living on earth. This is the ascension. We send you our deepest love and encouragement for your transformation. When you next see a bee visiting a flower or hear our familiar buzz, remember what we have said and let it serve as a call to awareness to open further to the oneness of all. Always know our love is truly with you because our love truly is you. So that's from the, the Deva of the Bees. And here's what I wrote about that channeling. What does this story of the three musketeers have in common with our beloved friends, the bees, who share this beautiful shimmering earth with us? Spirit uses every available channel to reach love to reach love and trigger awakening in us, whether it be popular culture or Liesl's channeling. 
The Three Musketeers often said to one another, quote, all for one and one for all. This catchphrase means all exist to serve you and you exist to serve all. It also means you are one with all and all are one with you. This saying is the essence of hive mindedness, the natural state of bees in which each serves the hive and the hive serves each. The original plan for humanity called for hive mindedness, a state of consciousness in which the mind would be in service to and but a tool of the heart. The heart is the center of you, your core, the place within you in which love with a capital L resides and connects you to all. We then decided to take a detour. We chose to develop and explore mind and logic. We placed a premium on analysis, deduction, and rational linear thought. In short, we lost our way. The deva of the bees comes to us now through Liesel to gently nudge us back on a higher path. In this lifetime, I have traveled the path of the mind. I chose to be born into a family that valued and emphasized intellect and academic accomplishment. I planned for this family to be in a Western society, a choice often made by souls who want to explore the mind. I planned for my mind to be sharpened by decades of intensive education. I also planned that later in life, I would come to an abrupt halt, turn 180 degrees and walk the other way, the way of the heart. That later in life time is now. In a profound between the worlds experience, just 10 days before the writing of these words, I was asked by those who love and guide me to state my intentions. Among the many I stated was, quote, I choose now to walk the way of the heart. Please show me how and help me to walk the way of the heart. The mind and the heart are the two most powerful vibrational fields in the human energy system. The weaker of the two naturally attunes to the stronger. This is very good news. It means that if you choose the way of the heart, if you decide to open, develop, and live in, with, through, and as your heart, your mind will come into sympathetic resonance with your heart. Your mind will come into resonance with love. Your mind will serve love. This is the invitation of the beings, the invitation of the musketeers, Athos, Porthos, and Aramis. For those of us who so choose, we are asked now to step out of the labyrinth of thought, to cease writhing in the throes of mentalized frenzies. We have traveled the path of the mind and found it to be a dead end. It's time for a change. The bees would have us turn around. They invite us to restore and return to the original plan for humans, meaning God, man, or God, woman, embodying, to embody love. We are in the shift of the ages, the great awakening. You who read these words have come to experience and indeed lead this evol evolutionary leap in consciousness, this embrace of the way of the heart. In the future, after this leap in consciousness is complete, you will look back upon these days of rapid change and expansion with wonder, awe, and tremendous fondness. The time is at hand, seize it. So there are some thoughts about what the bees had to say. Uh, one point I want to emphasize to you about that, uh, as many of you already know, humanity is going through an ascension process, the whole planet is. Uh, a big part of the ascension, you could say even the primary aspect of it, is a shift from mind-based consciousness to heart-based consciousness. So what's going on here, it's not just me who's doing this, uh, you're all doing it. If you're staying in a body on planet Earth, you're making this shift, some faster than others, some consciously, some without conscious awareness. But if you're staying in a body on Earth, as I understand it, you're making that shift. Now, I want to emphasize here, I'm not talking about resistance to the mind. Resistance will never foster spiritual growth and it will always cause some degree of suffering. So this is not about overcoming the mind, conquering the mind, getting rid of the mind, getting the mind to shut up or be quiet. That's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about two very powerful vibrational fields, the mind and the heart, 
And we're talking about setting the intention to have the heart be stronger, be predominant over the mind, with the mind a tool of and in service to the heart. That, as I understand it, was the original plan for humans. We lost our way, but we're finding our way back now. The process is easier, smoother, and a lot more enjoyable if you do it consciously, in my opinion. Yeah. And, you know, something that... Um that the beings of light have shared is that one of the reasons why in our society right now there is so much conflicting information and it actually almost seems impossible to get to the truth uh, through the mind if you like read the news or read stories about what's going on, right? You can't even discern anymore what is truth if, you, if you're looking at it sheerly through the lens of the mind. Well, that is actually purposeful. It's to help us propel us into navigating the world through the heart because the heart will tell you what is truth and what is not tr truth. And that is the, the litmus test um, to be using in the world right now. And the more you try to navigate the world from the mind, Right now, the more pain and suffering uh, you will have, as opposed to if you let the heart lead and allow, as Rob said, for the mind to become more in service to the heart using its discernment, but the actual mechanism by which you're, you're navigating and you're first synthesizing information is through the heart. Probably every single one of you has had the following two experiences multiple times in your life. The first is an experience in which somebody who on the surface has mm -hmm. complete credibility tells you something that on the surface is very easy to believe, and yet somehow you know that the person is lying to you. The second experience, I'll bet all of you have had multiple times, is the opposite of that. Somebody who is totally lacking in credibility says something that on the surface is outrageous and not believable, and yet you know that that person is telling you the truth. In both of those instances, how do you know what you know? The answer is your heart is like an early warning system. It's a detector of truth and a detector of falsehood. The mind just goes by what's been conditioned, what's logical, it may or may not discern the truth, but the heart, will vibrate in resonance with truth, and it will vibrate in a discordant way with untruth. That's how you know. Uh, we're going to, to take questions in a few minutes, but before we get to that, uh, we want to take a moment to tell you about some of our upcoming workshops. We have two online workshops in July. Uh, the first is the empath workshop for any of you who are empaths or believe you might be empaths. This is a wonderful workshop. It's on Tuesday of next week, uh, 7 to 9 p.m. U.S. Eastern Time. Lisa will channel the content, so do you want to tell them about it? Uh, sure. Um, you know, well, I consider myself to be kind of what you might call an extreme empath. I've always just felt everyone and everything all around me and and it's been it's been difficult to navigate this world with that uh going on and so uh over the past couple of years the beans of light have been working with me uh giving me different tools to to help um uh work with my empathic powers and actually to help recognize that they're a tremendous asset and that, that you can use that natural tendency you have to merge to start, instead of all merging so much in the horizontal direction, to start merging more in the vertical direction and merge more with source itself. And then also learning how to, when you do merge in this direction, merge merging more with the higher aspect of people as opposed to merging at the personality layer. Um, so there's a lot of different things that we're gonna uh, discuss in the, in the workshop. And there's also a really um, powerful uh, deep meditation that was channeled from the 
beans of light that Rob will lead everyone through. So uh, it's a it's a really great workshop for those of you who um, who resonate as empaths. So we have a, a discount for you, a coupon code, which is SUMMER, in all caps, SUMMER11, SUMMER11. And that will give you 15% off. Uh, and Stephanie, can you put a link to that? Yeah, I think Stephanie will probably post it in the chat. Yeah. And then uh, July 22nd, we have our Between Lives Soul Regression Workshop. So this is the form of hypnosis I practice, uh, known as a BLSR short. And we do a one day, sometimes it's a two day, but this one will be a one day BLSR workshop. What happens in a BLSR, it takes about two hours. It's a long process. We start with some preliminary steps to help you relax physically and mentally. And then I guide the group through a past life. It's almost always a past life that had a big impact on the plan for the current lifetime or is in some way thematically related to the current lifetime. You experience four different scenes in the past life, the last of which is the death scene. A part of your consciousness that is having this experience leaves the body in the death scene and crosses back over to the other side, which I know sounds a little bit ominous, but it's actually very easy and natural and gentle. When you get back to the other side, most likely you'll be greeted by one of your spirit guides. The guide will explain to you what's important to know about the past life you just experienced and why it was shown to you. And then you'll ask your guide to take you to what is called your council of elders. The council consists of the very wise, loving, and highly evolved beings who oversee your personal evolution. They know everything about you, everything about the plan for the current lifetime, and every other experience you've ever had. So when people get in front of their council, I prompt the group to ask a very long and extensive series of questions that covers all the major areas of your life. By the time that process is over, you should have a much better idea of what you plan for this lifetime, why you made those plans, how you're doing in terms of fulfilling your plan, and how you can better fulfill your plan. Uh, there are a couple of comments that people frequently make about what it's like to be in front of their council of elders. They talk about the great unconditional love the council has for them, that they feel radiating toward them. And, you know, for most people, uh, this is their first experience of truly unconditional love since coming into body. So it feels like a homecoming. People also comment on the total non-judgment of the council. They'll tell you honestly how you're doing in terms of fulfilling your plans, but there's no judgment associated with that. And in fact, people will say things like, I could tell that my council knew literally everything about me, including all the bad things I've done in my life, but they loved me completely anyway. So this is potentially a life-changing experience because if it's for your highest good, you can get an answer to literally any question you choose to ask. So this is on July 22nd. The code is SUMMER22. SUMMER, again, is in all caps. That will give you 15% off. And both of those coupon codes are good for 72 hours from right now. OK. So um, do you also want to talk about uh, Rise to the Pan? Oh, sure. So we have a, a monthly membership and mentorship program called Rise to the Path. It meets uh, usually the third Tuesday of every month uh, at 7 p.m. in the evening, Eastern, U.S. Eastern time uh, for 90 minutes. And the main intention here is to help people live the highest vibrational set of pre-birth plans they can live. So the way the beings of light have explained this to me and Lisa, they say it's not the case that you have just one set of pre-birth plans. Everybody has many sets of pre-birth plans. If you had a stack of sheets of paper, in this analogy, every sheet in the stack is one complete set of pre-birth plans. So each of you has your own stack of sheets of paper. The sheets toward the top of the stack are the highest vibrational pre-birth plans. Those are the plans where most of the learning is done through love, peace, and joy, not so much through pain and suffering. The sheets at the bottom of the stack, it's just the opposite. 
Those are the lowest vibrational pre-birth plans. That's where most of the learning is done through pain and suffering, not so much through love, peace, and joy. So what you want, of course, is to be as high in your personal stack of sheets of paper as you can be. So we talk about ways that you can raise your vibration and elevate yourself up through that stack of sheets of paper. That's the primary intention of Rise to the Path. But we talk about anything the members want to talk about. I, I think the really beautiful thing about it is that the members are, you could say, like-minded and like-hearted. Everybody's on, on a spiritual path. People are very much committed and dedicated to their spiritual path. And they come together and help each other rise in frequency. There's a tremendous amount of bonding and emotional support that goes on. Uh, if you're feeling a need for a community of like-hearted souls, th this is really a wonderful place to be. It really is. There's just, just amazing uh, people in this group. And uh, another thing that you then have access to as a member is we have recorded all the previous uh, sessions. So you have uh, access to the last uh, 12 months worth of sessions. There's all kinds of, uh, almost always uh, in any given session, um, I will lead a generally a longer channeled meditation. And a lot of those meditations are on the membership homepage or excerpted. So you can go whenever you want to do a meditation, you know, choose a meditation you want to do. Um, we post all of the, the channelings in there. So when you want, um, you know, some guidance and you want to, to just dip into some wisdom, um, you can go and look through all of the different meditations. So it's a great uh, resource. It gives you a lot of different things, uh, uh, different ways to lift your consciousness. And before we go to questions, this reminds me of another topic I want to talk about for a moment. Uh, speaking of community or lack of community, in one of our recent workshops, somebody asked a, a very good and important question, and I want to repeat the question and the answer I gave, because I think this will apply to and help a lot of you who are here tonight. Uh, the person asking the question, I think the word she used was frustration. She said she was feeling frustration with the family and friends and other people mm -hmm. in her life who are not awake and seemingly not awakening and wondering whether they're ever going to awaken and just feeling a lot of frustration with all of these people. And this, uh, I think, is a very natural way to feel if you are awake, very human, very understandable. But what I said to this person and what I want to share with all of you that I think can be helpful, the, the plan for ascension, as I understand it, and this is the plan among all eight and a half billion or whatever number of us are on earth now. The plan all along has been that the, a worldwide spiritual awakening would be led by a very small number of people. That includes all of you. If you're watching this, you're part of that small number of people who is leading a planetary spiritual awakening. The main reason that that is the plan, as opposed to, for example, having everybody awaken at more or less the same time, is that those of us who are leading the spiritual awakening wanted to have the experience of leading a planetary spiritual awakening. It really is that simple. In order for us to have that experience, that requires a very large group of people to lag behind in their awakening. So the people in your life who are not awake, who you might be annoyed by, disappointed in, frustrated with, from a pre-birth planning perspective, those people are acting in service to you. They're making it possible for you to have the experience you wanted to have. Okay. I think that's a really interesting way to look at it. Well, let's go to questions. Oh, and one other, one other thing I want to mention, um, we, Rob spoke just a little bit ago about that stack of papers analogy for your life plans, right? And one of the things that the beans of light always like to point out when uh, we share that analogy is to remember the thickness of a sheet of paper, right? How, like the thickness of a sheet of paper is almost negligible. It's, it's almost, um, you know, it almost seems like a two-dimensional object. 
when you think of a sheet of paper, but there's the, this little bit of thickness. And that could be, in terms of the analogy, that could be thought of as a quantum sliver of vibration. And so realize that if you just shift your vibration, even by a quantum sliver, even by the thickness of a sheet of paper, you're actually accessing a whole new set of life plans. So no change that you make in terms of your life, in terms of your consciousness, if it's a, if it's a shift, vibrational shift upwards, no change that you make is too small. It actually is really, really powerful, even the smallest of shifts. And it has a momentum to it as well. All right, so let's uh, take a few questions. Do you want me to give you a couple we have that were submitted? First? Well, actually, there's there's one here, someone sent to me by email that I want to start with. Uh, this person has asked, we know that we plan our life when we are, quote, between lives, but what happens when you start thinking on things you want to do for your next life while still living this life? Is it possible? Hmm. So interesting question. Uh, I know someone who in this lifetime uh, really, really loves himself, not in an unhealthy narcissistic way, but in a, a wholesome, uh, healthy way. He just has a lot of self-love. And he shared with me the following story. His last incarnation before this one, he was in a Nazi uh, prison camp during World War II. And I don't know how he did this, nor did he explain to me how he did this. But he said that the experience of being in a Nazi camp for several years was what caused him to develop self-love in that lifetime. So toward the end of the war, he was dying in the Nazi camp. And his last thoughts before he died were, this lifetime would have been so much more amazing if I had always loved myself the way I do now. I wish it had been like that. And then he died. Those final thoughts kicked off the current lifetime in which he came in to body with a lot of self-love. So those final thoughts are really important. That moment before death seems to be uh, an inflection point. Uh, sort of like a summer solstice or winter solstice, energetically, it's sort of where you're setting the direction you're going next. So I would invite you to keep that in mind and watch those final thoughts. All right. Hopefully those final thoughts were a ways away. <laughs> yeah, for all concerned. But. All right, Stephanie, you had some questions you pulled? Uh, yeah, so... Um... I think a couple were pretty good. I mean, it's just, I guess if you could kind of go more in depth about, you know, just uh, like one of them is like, I believe I have a soul's purpose, but I haven't found it yet. Um, and if we're here for a reason, why is it so hard to find out? I, feel like so, I, I want to say I empathize tremendously with the person who asked that question. Uh, that was the basics of my life plan. As I understand it, the first 40 years were more or less left open-ended for me to do whatever I wanted to do at the level of the personality. What that actually translated into was feeling lost and purposeless for 40 years. And it was when I was 40 that I had that experience of unconditional love walking down the street, which then changed everything and put me on the path that I'm still on to this day. Uh, so if you don't know what your purpose is and that for a long period of the life, it is possible that that is part of the plan. That could be planned for a number of reasons, one of which would just be to give freedom to the level of the personality to explore whatever interests them. But if you want to determine what you really came here to do, if your mission, for example, uh, this is nothing new, but follow your excitement, follow your joy, follow your interest. Excitement, interest, and joy are misunderstood in our world, I think. Those are communications direct from your soul. 
those feelings are your soul saying, yes, this is the way for you. Your soul will also speak to you through aspiration and inspiration. The things you aspire to do and are inspired by, that's coming from your soul. It's trying again to direct you. So look for interest, excitement, joy, aspiration, and inspiration. Another thing to remember is that, um, you know, we get indoctrinated in this world about being action oriented, about being external focused, like that, that our purpose has to be doing something in the world. And actually, um, your how your primary form of service is through your vibration. And then anything you do in the world is secondary to that. But you actually make a, you can make a tremendous impact in the world just by being, just by being in, in a high vibratory state. Um, and I think uh, in our follow-up um, email, I'll have uh, Stephanie include the Be the Love and Light uh, channeling from the Beings of Light. They, they really speak to this much more eloquently than I can. But um, is there anything that you want to add on that topic? To, just to emphasize that you know, in this time period of ascension, which we're, we're really in right now, we're in the, the meat of it. Your, your vibration is a more in, important contribution really than ever before. Uh, what Spirit is asking all of us to do now is vibrate at the frequency of love, peace, joy, harmony, and so forth. Uh, you don't necessarily have to do anything. And the average person, I would say, their mission does not necessarily include action that contributes directly to ascension. But everybody's vibration contributes in a big, big way or holds it back in a big way. All you have to do is just be, sit calmly, meditate, look up at the clouds, the stars, enjoy the day, laugh, play, have fun. That is a huge, huge contribution to the ascension. And then as you access that state, as you access that state of consciousness, if there is action in the external world that is wanting to happen through you, then that will become more and more clear. And it will be coming from the heart and not coming from the mind. That's, that's the challenge is a lot of times, too, we try to find what, what is our purpose through the mind. Well, that's not that's not going to navigate us there. This is what's going to navigate us there. One of the telltale signs, uh, as you look for your purpose or try to determine your life plan, if if it's the ego mind speaking to you, it will use words like should, need to, have to, ought to, must. You must do this. You should do that. You have to do this. If those are the thoughts that are going through your mind when you try to determine what to do in life, that's a good bet that it's coming from the ego. And the ego does not understand ascension. It does not understand pre-birth planning. It does not understand spiritual principles. It's just a biocomputer that has been highly conditioned with all sorts of shoulds, need to, ought to, have to, and must. So if you hear that kind of language in your thoughts, uh, it's probably a good idea not to take them too seriously. I mean, I guess to kind of parlay off of that a little bit, I know we get asked a lot of times is, you know, um, why, and I'm kind of kind of generalize this because there was a bunch of them, you know, why do we have bad things happen in our lives or why would we plan for things such as a cancer, an illness, a uh, suicide, rape, abuse, addiction, bad accidents, you know, for planning that in our pre-birth plan. Um, can you maybe elaborate on why some of us go through hard things and why we find it so challenging to understand why we may have put that there ourselves? Yeah, I'll expand a little bit more beyond the five reasons I listed earlier. Uh, in the two-day Between Life Soul Regression Workshop, we do an exercise that I call the Divine Virtues Exercise. And what I found in the research for my three books, when I, you know, I went into many, many people's pre-birth planning sessions 
and had the extraordinary opportunity to listen to the conversations they had when they were planning all the challenges Stephanie just listed. And over a period of time, I noticed that when these kinds of challenges were being planned, a lot of the conversation revolved around a soul level desire to cultivate and then express while in body certain qualities that are very important to the soul. I gave these qualities the name divine virtues. And over a period of years, I put together a list of the ones that came up the most often. This is the list we work with in the divine virtues exercise. I think there are now 28 on the list. It's things like unconditional love, compassion, patience, empathy, faith, trust, and so on. The average person is working on two or three virtues in a lifetime. Uh, occasionally, somebody is working on four or five. The person who's working on four or five almost always has a life filled with trauma. As far as I know, nobody is working on more than five virtues. That would be too much for anybody to take on. And Stephanie, can I put up the whiteboard here? Is that function working? Um, yeah, it should be. Let me. Where is it under reactions? No, no, I think it's in a share screen, isn't it? Um, oh, yeah, there, there it is. is. Okay. Let me, uh, oh, you, gonna... you have it. Yes, right. the, We're just... getting all techno tonight. <laughs> Impressive. I just want to <laughs> show you guys something. This is a graph that I draw when we do the divine virtues exercise. And we'll explain in better detail what I'm talking about. So the, the X or horizontal axis is time. I'll just put a T. This is, if you'll forgive the play on words, this is the time of your life. You're born here at the zero point. And if you have an average lifespan, you die somewhere over here. The Y or vertical axis is your level of consciousness. I'll just put a C. Now, a very common pre-birth plan looks like this. You're born here. This is the level of consciousness you bring into the body at birth. And then the plan calls for this to happen. No. The plan calls for a line to appear here. Oh, no. What are you doing now? Uh, I can't get it to draw Can you get it back to the, go back to draw, go hit yeah. on, hit draw. See if that works. There you go. Okay. So the plan calls, forget the box, but the plan calls for this. So there's a number of years where you're making incremental gains in consciousness. And then the plan calls, oh shoot. Yeah, there we go. Then the plan calls for that to happen. This point here is a pre-planned inflection point. It's most likely a big challenge, like one of the ones Stephanie just listed, that you yourself planned in the hope that your level of consciousness would spike up like this. So this really in a nutshell is conceptually why we plan big challenges for ourselves. Now, if you're really on the ball, you're going to say, well, Rob, you listed five reasons for planning big challenges and you didn't say anything about divine virtues. That's true. I didn't mention them directly, but I did refer to them indirectly with number three, service to others. So what's the connection? The connection is, as Liesl said a moment ago, your primary form of service to others is through your vibration. And when you raise your consciousness like this, in other words, when you cultivate divine virtues, you're raising your vibration, which means you're making greater service to others. So all of this, the cultivating and expressing of divine virtues falls under number three, service to others. Okay, what else do we have? Should we take one live here? Um, yeah, why we not? have more uh, that are sort of thematically um, grouped together. I did have one that was kind of interesting. It's not really thematic, but I thought it was interesting because I know you guys cover this sometimes and talk about it. And I feel like it's always on top of mind of everyone um, is what the current state of the world is and how like there could be, you know, be beyond the ascension, but like the doomsday and the disaster that could be coming and all the sad things that are currently going on in the world and why that might be and what we could kind of do to 
play like I, I guess what I mean is too is like how Rob says like how we all kind of plan to be here right and it was we fought member to be like one we put oh, yeah. a lottery for it and maybe kind of elaborate on that and what you know um why the world is kind of in the state it is there was a few questions about that uh, so I'll, I'll refer you to we actually did an entire course for the shift network on ascension uh, and you can find that course on the shift network website but Here's the, the gist of the answer. Uh, and I want to preface this by saying uh, I do not follow the news at all. And the reason I don't follow the news is because, uh, to use the words of Neil Donald Walsh, I'm not zipped up. Somebody asked him once, is it okay to watch the news? And he says, yes, it is if you're zipped up, by which he meant your vibration won't come down if you watch negative news. But mine does. I'm apparently not zipped up. And I know how powerful my vibration is. I want it to contribute to the world, not hold the world back from ascension. That's why I don't watch the news. The reason the news is crazy, uh, perhaps crazier than ever before from what people tell me, is that ascension is being caused by a lot of divine light direct from source flooding the planet. So in the long run, this is a very positive thing. It's creating the ascension. But in the short term, it creates a difficult process known as purification. Purification means that this light from source is bringing to the surface, is bringing to conscious awareness, everything unlike itself, everything of a lower vibration. This is happening collectively to the entire human race, which is why the news is the way it is now. It's also happening individually in each person's life, whether they know it consciously or not. So in terms of your individual lives, what it means is that your stuff, so to speak, is going to come to the surface. It's going to be brought to your conscious awareness, not as some kind of punishment, but so that as we talked about earlier, you can find out what lies within your consciousness. And if there's something there you need to release, heal, process, you can go about doing that. So whatever your stuff might be, if it hasn't come to your conscious awareness yet, you should expect that it probably will. And then just trust your guidance, trust your intuition to let you know how to process it or release it or let it go. Yeah. And, you know, there, I'm also going to have um, Stephanie include another uh, channeling uh, by the Beings of Light uh, that's literally entitled Ascension, uh, which goes which is very relevant to this question. Um, and there's an analogy that they, uh, that they draw in that uh, channeling that, they, that what's going on right now is it's like, uh, it's like poison being expelled from the collective body of humanity. And so it's coming to the surface. And that, so that's, that's what you're seeing. That's what the news is covering is all of the poisons um in the world um and one of the things that the beings of light point out in that channeling is that the remedy for poison is not more poison so to be very careful not to meet all that all of that with adversarial energy because you can't fight the darkness that just actually fans the energy of the darkness you can only meet the darkness with so much light that it just eventually illuminates and eradicates the pockets of darkness because if you think about it this way think about what light and darkness is darkness isn't its own substance darkness is just the absence of light light is its own is its own substance and so there's really, when there's darkness, there's really just that there's nothing there. So when you shine enough light, it just automatically eliminates the darkness. For those of you who feel compelled to follow the news, I would invite you to consider reading about it rather than watching it mm -hmm. on TV or watching it on the internet. Uh, I believe it lowers your vibration much less if you read about it rather than see horribly graphic images of whatever right. it might be. Also keep in mind that it's it's a very selective thing, right? It, it all, You're only being fed 
that which is really the darkest information out there. Look, the fact that we have this going on this evening, this isn't going to make the news, right? But this is a, a tremendously powerful vibrational field that's being created in, in the collective right now. You know, there's 235 people on this call and there's more that are going to watch the recording. We're making a huge impact in the, in the world. Yet that's not going you're never going to see that on a news program. So keep in mind that it's really it's skewing your interpretation of reality because it's only showing you you know the 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 darkest things that are going on in the world. There, there actually are, I don't know the names of them, but there are like some nice news uh, organizations and things like that where people, you know, report like inspirational stories and things like that. And so I would encourage you to, if you are going to take in the regular news, you might want to also just take in some of that other news so that it, you, it doesn't skew your perception into thinking that that's all that's going on in the world. Yeah, there's a wonderful newsletter I get called Reasons to be Cheerful, focused solely on positive news. And there's another one, which I believe is called Karuna News, Karuna meaning compassion, also focused on positive stories. The, the mainstream news, in, in my opinion, I don't want to go too far down this rabbit hole, but it's intended to generate fear. And it's worth asking the question, who profits from fear? 